Good morning. It is a wonderful day. Um, Psalm says, today is a day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Did any of your parents teach you that song? Today is a day. Today is a day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Everybody. Um, so, actually, what's funny about that is I remember, um, I remember as a kid, you know, teach your kids scripture in song. It's so easy. And I remember, you know, we, growing up with, uh, as the second child of five kids in, in our house, I had an older sister who ruled with an iron fist. Um, and then I was the oldest boy, uh, so I was just the first one she beat up. Um, but, I love you, Grace, if you're watching. Um, but, and then we had, you know, I had three younger brothers myself, and, and I ruled them with an iron fist, you know? What goes around comes around. Um, no, but uh, as a kid, we would clash, if you can believe it. We were a bunch of rowdy boys, and we would often uh, have tiffs and little uh, scrimmages with each other. Um, and something that my parents taught us is this song, Be kind one unto another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, one another. Just as God, through Jesus, has forgiven you. Ooh, ooh. Doodly do. <laughs> Ephesians 4.32. Right? So, and as a kid, as a kid, after punching Gabriel or kicking Colin or whatever, Lewis, sorry, um, uh, it was, be, hey, guys, be kind, after I got a spanking, be kind, one and two, another. Um, but now as an adult, as a teenager, what I didn't realize then, and I realize now, Ephesians 4.30, hey, wait a second, I'm memorizing scripture, right? We ought to be kind, one and two, another. We ought to be tender-hearted. We ought to be forgiving each other just as God, through Jesus, has forgiven you. Amen? We, and we're going to be talking about that today. We're going to be talking about loving people. Love people. We're in the middle of our sermon series called Setting the Course, and we've been going through the vision of the River Church. Um, really, the last several weeks, we've been going through the vision of the River Church, we've, and really, we're just trying to keep our desire forefront to keep the main thing the main thing. Amen? We want to live by the Word. We want to live and follow Jesus Christ. He's made us new creations in Him by His precious blood that He shed for us on the cross. And we have power to walk out this life in Him because of His resurrection in the Holy Spirit who makes His home in our hearts. Amen? You know, we just had a weekend encounter retreat this last uh, few days, Friday and Saturday. Anybody on the encounter? You know, God was doing wonderful things to set the captives free. Amen? And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to set the captives free, destroy the works of the enemy, and redeem a people unto Himself. Amen? To bridge the divide between us and the Father, to pay the price of sin that was truly ours to pay. Right? And He came, and now just as God has forgiven you. Be kind to one another. Be tender-hearted. We're going to talk about loving each other. So, last several weeks, um, so all that to say, teach your kids scripture songs. It will benefit them later in life. Even the doodly do dudes part. Um, so last several weeks we've been talking about, and I'll actually just put up the, the vision of the River Church is that we would be a place to know and love God, and to grow and love people. Amen? And you know what? That is a Scripture thing. 
That's not like, uh, you know, what, what is the difference between a catchphrase and a vision statement? Purpose. What do you, you know, I'm loving it, but up, up, but uh, you know, it's like, we're not going to go to McDonald's. That's, that's a marketing placement tool, right? But a vision statement is something, it's a tool to help us keep the main thing the main thing. Amen? It's help us to set our compass to true north and say, Jesus, this is what I see in Scripture. This is what I see you're calling us to do. This is what we want to set our course and set our path to follow. And you know what? When we're wondering, you know, am I on the right, am I on the right path? Am I, doing, am I going where I need to be? You can not just look to the vision of the church. You look at, you look at to, to Scripture. Look at what Scripture says, and, and that's true north. Amen? God, this is your plan for my life. I, you, you speak wonderful things for me. Your thoughts for me, Psalm 139, are so wonderful, I can't even comprehend them. And when we lose sight of our destination, we get lost. Right? We get off course. So we want to set the course and stay on track. Amen? So the last several weeks we've been going through this, we want to, at the River Church, our desire is that we would be a place where you know God. We want to know God biblically, not just our opinion. Our culture is full of a lot of opinions, right? And, um, you know, it used to be that the crazy opinions was just that one guy down the street that your parents told you to avoid, right? Right? Now everybody has a soapbox, everybody has a platform, anybody who's anybody can share what's on their heart. Um, but we want to know what God says biblically. We want to know Him biblically, we want to know Him personally. We need to know God because we need to be saved. Do you know the Lord? We need to be transformed not just behavior modification. We want to be transformed by the living God. Amen? And then the week after that, we're talking about loving God, worshiping Him for who He is. Amen? If you know Him, you start to worship Him because you know who He is. It's just a natural overflow of finding out who God is. See, worshiping God, loving God is our devotion, our pursuit of Him, our obedience to Him. Come on, the Word says that if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. We want to love God. Amen? We want to honor Him with our lives. And then to grow. Healthy things that are living grow. Right? Healthy people grow. It's a healthy expectation that Jesus wants us to grow in our faith. And we hope that this is a place where you can do just that. We want you to grow in your faith. And you know, that's a process until we see Him face to face. That's an ongoing process. And we're all at different levels, but we're all in this together. Amen? So we need to be a people that is committed to, not just to growing, but to committed to helping the people around us grow as well. Um, how many guys know, you know, all of us cried and moaned when we heard that Jeff and Casey are moving away. Why is that? Because they're part of the body of Christ. Because they're a part of our family. The church, is a, the church is the family of God, and we bear each other's burdens. We love each other. We help each other grow, and they've been an integral part of this church family. So, I mean, we rejoice in their next chapter, but it's, it's tough. It's tough. Love you, Casey. Love you, Jeff. And not to mention, the Holy Spirit is the one sanctifying us and helping us grow. Last week, who was here last week? What a wonderful service. What a wonderful testimony of God, how God is using little old us's to impact the nations of the world. Amen? We kind of did part one of loving people. Loving people where Ray and Steve Stadler got, had the opportunity of going to Kenya and digging a well and just testimony after testimony of how that well is bringing not just 
practical water to that community, but it's going to bring living water, and that church is going to thrive in Jesus' name. Amen? I mean, we're talking like 100,000 people that that well can impact. I mean, a drought for two plus years. I mean, we in our modern convenience just can't comprehend that. Um, But really, it's a core value of this church that we believe that God is the God of the nations. Amen? We believe that uh, we wholeheartedly support missions all over the world. We have, we have several missionaries that impact different parts of the world, and we're going to continue to pour our time, our resources, um, our efforts into world missions. And it's not just to the nations, but it's Mission Fairbo. Amen? It's Mission Minnesota. It's Mission surrounding areas. We believe that the Great Commission is for here and there. Amen? So that's what we've been talking about. And today, I want to continue the theme of loving people and look at the story. We're going to actually go to Luke chapter 10, if you have your Bibles. Luke chapter 10. And we're going to be looking at the story of the Good Samaritan and kind of doing loving people part two. Okay? Luke chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to open it. If you don't, it's going to be on the screen, but I just encourage you to bring your Bible. I mean, Ephesians chapter 6 says it's the sword of the Spirit. I mean, and you don't want to be caught without your sword. Amen? Or if you're uncomfortable with carrying a sword, it's also a lamp to our path. So... You know, don't caught, get caught in the dark without your flashlight. I like the sword, personally. Okay, we're going to be looking at how loving people means getting involved, serving them, and sharing the hope we have in Christ. Okay? Loving people is getting involved, it's serving others, and sharing the hope that we have in Christ. Luke chapter 10. We're going to start in verse 25, and we're going to go through verse 37. So I'm going to read it, and we'll dive right in. Verse 25, it says, And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Verse 29, But wishing to justify himself, he said, Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance a priest was going down on that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. And he came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring oil and wine on them. And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more money you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Uh, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy toward him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same, or likewise. Let's bow our heads and pray this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just glorify your name this morning. Father, we thank you that you're the one who sets the captives free, who binds up the brokenhearted, who gives sight to the blind eyes, who opens the ears of the deaf and heals those who are lame and cannot walk. Lord, we thank you that you make us new creations 
when we're found and hidden in Christ. Lord, I pray that you would open up the word to us this morning and that you would speak to us and reveal Jesus this morning to us. Holy Spirit, we just glorify you and we ask that you would move on our hearts and open our eyes and ears to what you're speaking to us today. We love you, Lord, and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we have a lawyer. A lawyer stands up and tries to test Jesus. What is it with lawyers? I mean, I mean if you're a lawyer, please take no offense. Um, But we have a lawyer who stands up to test Jesus, and he says, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? How many of you guys know that that's a good question? Right? That's a good question. And it's not the first time Jesus has been asked that, if you look at the Gospels. And what's interesting is Jesus' response to his question, what does he say? What does Jesus say when he's asked that question? He said to him, what is written in the law? It's like we got to know God biblically. Weird. Right? And obviously, what do we need to inherit eternal life? We need Jesus. He's standing right there. He's talking to him. But Jesus says, go to Scripture. Because you know what? Scripture reveals Jesus. Did you know that? I hope you know that. So he says, what is written? Do we know God? And he says, how do you read it? And he answers correctly, right? He answers well. He says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This guy goes to the river. He's got a good theology. I'm just kidding. But he answers correctly. But, you know, have you ever been in an argument or a discussion with someone and you're just really hoping to jab them and they, you ask them a question and they give you the exact answer you were hoping in like a good way, but it throws you off because you want to be mad, but they had a pretty good answer to your question? You know what I'm saying? No. <laughs> Never happened, huh? Says the married guy. Um, <laughs> um, so, <laughs> it's never happened to me either. Actually, you know what? It, there was, there was a. <laughs> don't. <laughs> my wife's given me the no. Don't share that story. Um, anyways, all right. Um, But, you know, sometimes we can have the right answer with the wrong heart, right? We can have the right answer with the wrong heart. And and you see this situation where this lawyer, what was his heart? We look a few verses earlier, his heart was to test Jesus. His heart was to test Jesus. And when he answers, Jesus is like, yep, that's right. Good job. And it just got under his skin so much. And you've got to realize, you have, you have this, this modern, or this ancient time, you have, you have the Roman occupation, you have Samaritans, you have people from all over the place in this, in this hub of Jerusalem, okay? And there's a lot of dynamics. You have, you have political dynamics where you have the, the zealots, the J- Jewish zealots, who are, who are fervently um, for, for the... I mean, you could say they're the conservatives of the day, okay? And then you have the tax collectors, who you could say are like the liberals uh, of the day. And you ha- so you have these, all these dynamics going on in the culture, and people are pitted against each other constantly. And because this lawyer asks him a question and gets not the response he was looking for, what does it say next? He says... He says, but wishing to justify himself, he said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And what is he hoping Jesus does? He's hoping Jesus pigeonholes some group of people. He's he's looking to trick Jesus. He's, He's looking for Jesus to say, well, the Jews, well, the Samaritans, 
Well, the zealots. Well, the tax collectors. Well, the Romans. And Jesus, in fact, if you, after you read it, you realize Jesus answers neither of those questions, but asks another question after he tells him a story. And the man answers his own question correctly again. Jesus has a way of getting to the heart of the matter. Amen? So let's, let's go into the story of the Good Samaritan. So that's the premise of what's going on, you have to realize. This man with the wrong heart is saying, who's my neighbor? Who am I supposed to love? And I hope we find out who we're supposed to love this morning as well. So verse 30, it says, Jesus replied and said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers, and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Something you need to understand, the the road from Jerusalem to Jericho was a treacherous road. It was a road where this type of thing happened often. And so for this man to go down to Jericho by himself was pretty foolish. You could almost even say he got what was coming to him. Okay? So you need to understand that, but this is really where I want to start because whether it's because of our circumstances, our situations, or really the impacts of sin in our lives, verse 30 describes the situation of a lot of us. And I would say all of us. There is a thief, John 10.10 says, there is a thief that wishes to steal, kill, and destroy. And the wages of sin is death. Okay? Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death. And so when we have, you know, whether it was our fault, just indulging in sinful things, or whether circumstances happened to us, a lot of us are like this man who went down to Jericho and we've been left stripped, beaten, and half dead. Can anybody relate to that? And if we're really honest, maybe those aren't your circumstances, but the impact of sin and our sinful nature in our lives leaves us just the same. So what does it mean to love people? If this is the situation that most of us find ourselves in, and I'll just tell you folks, our culture is confused, and it's hurting, and it's looking for answers. And you know what? There are a lot of people that are quite enjoying the lives that they're living, and they're going a million miles an hour in the opposite direction from the Lord and His ways and everything like that, because sin is pleasurable for a time and for a season. But there will come a day where every single one of us in this room is going to stand before the living God and He's holy and we'll have to give an account for our lives. And it's not about all the good stuff or the bad stuff that we did. It's what did you do with the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross? Because you can have people who were stripped, beaten, and half dead, and it was their own darn fault, right? But for anybody who is in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone, and the new has come. Amen? People need the love of Jesus. So what does it mean to love people? You look at the Samaritan. Let's keep going. In verse 31 through 33, it says, And by chance a priest was going down on the road, and when he saw him, this beaten man, he passed by on the other side. And likewise, a Levite, the Levites were the people who ministered in the temple, okay? The priests were the key leaders, but the Levites were those who ministered in the temple. So we have a Levite also, when he came to the place, he saw him and passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan who was on the journey came to him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion. My first point today is that loving people means getting involved. Getting involved. You know, the priest passed by, 
and the Levite passed by, and we would say the pastor, okay? The pastor passed by the man. The churchgoer passed by the man. And you know, our title or our reputation does not necessarily mean that we are loving others. Right? Can we be honest with ourselves? And that's why a lot of folks are upset with Christians is because we are nominal, which means in name only. Okay? And you know what? I don't say that as an indictment to us all because we all have good days and we all have bad days. And God's grace is new. His mercy is new every morning for us to follow Him and get on the right track. Amen? Amen. You're sitting in a room with authentic, real people, and hypocrisy is something that happens sometimes. Okay? So let's try to be genuine and authentic. Okay? that, That means repentance. That means being real. Okay? But our title, you know what? Just because the guy was a pastor doesn't mean... He got involved in that other person's life, right? And just because it was a Levite, someone who ministered in the temple, doesn't mean he got involved. And I don't even think it's an indictment on the priests or the Levites. I think it's just an illustration that you can be somebody and still not do something, right? I don't think this is saying that priests and Levites are bad by any means, I think what it's illustrating, and you know what? Jesus even used Samaritans, and Samaritans were looked down on big time because they were half Jews. They were half breeds, okay? They were looked down on big time, and I think Jesus purposely uses this person who a lot of other people have a problem with to illustrate it doesn't matter who you are, loving people is getting involved, right? Loving people is actually loving people, right? You know, um, well, let me keep going. The Samaritan actually stepped into this person's life and ministered to him. And this is what Christ did for us, we have to realize, right? Jesus actually got involved in our mess and loved us. Right? Isaiah 9, verse 2, it says, The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Jesus came into our darkness. He is the light of the world, and He came into our darkness. I love that there's a, there's a passage in the book of Zechariah where it talks about Um, how we're like sticks pulled from the fire. Jesus reached into the fire and pulled us out through the cross. Amen? He, when he, uh, when the angel was speaking to Joseph, he's saying that God is Emmanuel. And maybe that wasn't Joseph, man, that was the angels. But, I mean, we talk about it during the whole Christmas season. He's Emmanuel. What does that mean? But God with us. He came. He got involved. And He cares. Exodus, when the, when the Israelites were suffering in Egypt, what does it say? I've heard their cry. I'm aware of what's going on. And I'm going to do something about it. Amen? We, hear, we serve a God who hears and is able to respond. John 3, 16 and 17. We know this verse, but actually, look at it again. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. The world stood condemned already if you keep on reading. You know, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all gone our own way. We've all gone astray. But you know what? Jesus came and got involved in our need. Amen? So in our sin, in our brokenness, Christ gave His life that we would be made whole and new. 
In 1 John 4.19, I don't think it's up there, but what we have to realize is it says that we are able to love. We love because He first loved us. How do we love people? We first have to realize that we have been loved by the Father. Right? Loving others should be a natural outworking of the love that we ourselves have received from the Lord. It should be totally natural. What has God done for you? It should just be the overflow to others. And you know what? Sometimes it's a sacrifice. Sometimes it is work. But you know what? When we really understand what we've been forgiven of, what God has done in our lives, it's just a natural response to reciprocate and let that flow out of our lives to other people. Amen? Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. You know, Jesus, there was a story also in the book of Luke where this immoral woman was crying and washing Jesus' feet with her tears and her hair. And the, the, the Pharisees just couldn't deal with it. They're like, do you know who's touching you? Like, do you realize this lady's reputation? And Jesus told a story about two debtors. One who had been forgiven much and one who had been forgiven little. And he asked the Pharisees, who loves more? The person who has been forgiven much or the person who has forgiven, been forgiven little? And they knew the right answer. They obviously responded, the person who has been forgiven much. And Jesus said to them, those who have been forgiven much love much. If we have no love for others, maybe we've forgotten the love that Christ has extended to us. And maybe we don't even know to the extent that Christ loved us first. Right? 1 John 4, 9 through 11. It says, God showed how much He loved us by sending His one and only Son into the world so that we might have eternal life through Him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. Right? You know, we talked about this morning giving out of compulsion. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver, that we shouldn't give under compulsion. And you know what? We shouldn't love out of compulsion either. But you know what? God in His wisdom knows that our hearts can grow cold and we're stubborn sometimes, so He commands us to do it anyways. Right? And sometimes, you just got to start doing it. And then you'll remember to the extent that Christ laid down His life for us. So are you involved in the lives of others? Just like the Samaritan. Or are you hoping the pastor does it? Right? Are you hoping the other church person does it? Are you involved in the lives of others? And I'm, guys, I'm talking inside and outside the church. You know, there's like a, over a hundred verses talking about how the body of Christ in the New Testament is supposed to love one another. And all the one another's that we interact with each other regarding. So we need to Love the person next to you. We need to love the world. Amen? Because that's what Christ did for us. So my second point here, loving people, is loving people means serving others. Serving others. Verse 33 through 35, it says, But a Samaritan who was on the journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him and bandaged up his wounds, pouring out oil and wine on them. 
And he put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day, he took out two denarii, his own money, and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. How many of you guys would like that type of care in your time of need? Amen? But loving people means serving others. Serving others. The Samaritan served this broken man. He gave of his time. He gave of his talent. He gave of his treasure. He took what was his, rightfully his, and he used it to serve this man. Matthew 20, verse 28. What does it say? Jesus, the Son of Man, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You guys, Jesus is our example in everything. Amen? He's our example in everything. And Jesus didn't come, the king of the universe. I mean, he left his glorious throne in majesty to come and serve us. That is humility. That is love. Loving people means serving others. It's taking the mercy and compassion and giftings and resources that God has blessed us with and using them to serve others and love others for His glory. Amen? What does it say that if you've done these things to the least of these, you've done them to me? But Lord, when did we see you thirsty? When did we see you hungry? When did we see you naked? When did we, when did we visit you in prison? When you've done these to the least of these, you've done them to me. We have to realize that we serve unto the Lord. And people are who Jesus came for. Amen? That's why he came. Jesus didn't come to redeem the Rocky Mountains. Okay? Okay? And they're beautiful, by the way. Actually, we went there on... Actually, I can't confirm that because we went there on our honeymoon and I didn't bring my glasses. So I don't know if the Rocky Mountains are beautiful. I was like, this is great. <laughs> Big mistake. <laughs> Got to go back. Um, anyways, um, you know, and again, serving others, this happens inside and outside the church. You know, we need to realize it's both and, right? It's both and. If you're a part of a family, you serve your family. That was, you know, we were raised to help out. It's like, well, those aren't my Legos. Well, I don't care. We're a family. Clean up your brother's Legos. It's like we're cleaning the house. We're not cleaning your stuff. Can I get a witness? I mean... <laughs> I'm having the same conversations with my kids. It's like, that's not mine. It's like, yeah, it's ours. Well, it's mine. Do you want me to confiscate all your cool toys? I don't threat. I don't threaten. Sometimes I, I can either confirm nor deny. Um, you know, we work together and we serve one another because we are a family, and from the family of God, we reach the world. Amen? We ought to be serving each other so that we can serve the world. Inside the church, I mean, think about it. How has God gifted you so that the entire body can grow and benefit? I mean, think about that for a minute. How has God gifted you? And you know what? Not that, and it's all about the heart, so please don't think I'm God's gift to this church. I mean, but you are, right? How has God gifted you that the people around you, in this body even, need what God has placed in your life? You read Ephesians 4, verse 15 and 16, if you could put that up there. It says, instead we speak the truth in love to each other, growing in every way more and more like Christ. So this is how we grow to be more like Christ. Who wants to be more like Christ? We should all want to be more like Christ, right? So this is how that happens. Christ, who is the head of his body, the church, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. 
it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. What has God placed in your life that will help the whole body of Christ be healthy and growing and full of love that we would be more like Christ? You know, sometimes we say, ah, I don't have anything to bring to the table. And you know what? We should have a heart of humility. But sometimes, how has God gifted you? God has put a gift in you that the body of Christ needs so that we can be more like Jesus. Right? You know, Jesus talks about, don't let your light, I mean, let your light shine before all men that they would see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And it says this funny thing that I was, it's like, why would he say that? Don't hide your light under a bushel basket. First off, they didn't have LEDs, so if you put your light under a bushel basket, you're going to cause a fire. But besides that, it's just a normal thing that we do sometimes where we have these gifts, talents, and abilities that God has placed in our lives because we're all different, folks. And we just say, nah. And we hide it. Or like the parable of the talents, we, we think that God is a harsh taskmaster and so we bury it. And you know what? We're not supposed to bury the talents that God's given us. We're supposed to use them for His glory. Invest them for His glory. Amen? When you invest your talents, they multiply. Right? The body of Christ needs you to grow and mature in Christ. And that's, you know, that's the Word of God. That's, that's not my pitch to get you serving in some way in the church. We need each other to grow in that way. Now, my pitch is that you would serve some way in the church. <laughs> right? Get involved. Get involved. Has God blessed you with a talent, an ability? Has He put a certain thing on your heart? You know, next month we're going to be having a serve team rally in the basement here where all the heads of the different departments, the volunteers that help make our whole church run, we're going to dive in and see how we can expand and broaden and bring in people who want to get involved. So it's like, how has God blessed you? And listen, outside the church, you know, Jesus laid his life down for people while we were still a mess. Okay? He served others while they couldn't care less. Romans 5.8, it's up there. It says, But God demonstrates His own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Not after we cleaned ourselves up. Not after we changed all of our behavior and, and picked up good habits and behavior modification to trick Jesus that we're a good person so that He'll use us. You know, Jesus, He sees our hearts, okay? And while we were yet sinners, He demonstrated His love for us and died for us, okay? The, sometimes the more we try to modify our behavior to be acceptable for God, the more we're just moving ourselves away from His grace that wants to transform us. And we're just doing, trying to do what God needs to do by His Spirit through our own self-effort and our own self-will. The book of Galatians talks about that. And Paul actually tells that whole church, hey, who tricked you? Who, who, and he actually uses stronger language. He says, who bewitched you? Who tricked you that you, what you started in the spirit, you're going to perfect by the flesh and your own effort? Like, who tricked you? Don't do that. So we have to, we have to take that heart that Christ had for us, that while we were still a work in progress, He died for us and served us and showed us a better way. Amen? How many of you guys know that we can get involved in people's lives and serve them without compromising the truth? 
Amen? We're called to live a life after Christ's example. And the Samaritan, you know, he gave of his own resources and, and even extended a loan and didn't expect payment. And isn't that like Christ? Because what could we repay the King of glory who laid down his life for us? What could we repay? And in fact, Romans chapter 12 makes it clear. Therefore, since he did lay down his life for us, let us submit our lives to him as a living sacrifice. My last point when it comes to loving people is that loving people means sharing the hope of Christ. Sharing the hope of Christ. If you look at the last couple verses of this passage, verse 36 and 37, Jesus comes, he's done with this, this parable, this story of the Samaritan. And he asks the lawyer, right? This is a conversation with this lawyer. He asks the lawyer, which of these three people, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? And he said, the one who showed mercy towards him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Go and do the same. Isn't it interesting that Jesus illustrates what it means to love your neighbor without using the word love without telling you who your neighbor is. And he perfectly answers the question. Do you realize that? Jesus didn't say who your neighbor was. Go and do the same. He helped the lawyer see that the one who showed mercy was the one who was truly loving his neighbor. Because, again, Christ is our example. Christ showed mercy to us. When we didn't deserve it, when we couldn't earn it, Christ showed mercy to us. There's hope in the cross. There's hope in the resurrection. There's hope in what he's done for us. Loving people is sharing the mercy of Christ. It's the gospel It's the truth that says, though you're dead in sin, Christ can make you alive and whole and free through his cross, his burial, and his resurrection. There is true freedom and transformation in what Christ has accomplished on the cross. And that is the love that we need to share with the world. Amen? We're called to get involved. We're called to serve others and not walk on the wayside like the priest and Levite did. We might have titles, we might have a reputation, but we actually need to get involved. Okay? God has entrusted this responsibility to us. You know, it's the Great Commission. It's the Great Commission. You know, and I... Well, let's let's put that up. Matthew 28, 19. Um, It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. You know what? It doesn't say make converts, right? It doesn't say go seal the deal and sign contracts. You know what a disciple is? It's a relational connection where you're teaching someone how to live. We're called to make disciples. We're called to get involved in people's lives. And you know what? That needs to happen to those who are lost. We've been commanded to go. Jesus' words, go. Let's do this. Amen? And that happens here as well. We need to be disciples of Christ here and so we can help make disciples out there. Right? Often, you've heard it said that you can't give what you don't have. 
And my question to you is, are you a disciple? What is a disciple? Someone who is following Christ, who's growing, who knows God, who loves God, who is committed to growing, and will love others in the same way that they've experienced. Amen? Are you a disciple? I mean, we're in the middle of our winter small group session. If you go in the back table, there are small groups all you know throughout the week. There are lots of ways to get involved and get connected. You know, we need to grow. We need to grow because not only are our gifts and our talents used for building up the body of Christ, those gifts and those talents need to be fostered in such a way that we can reach the nations for His glory. Amen? It's not just so we can have a better place on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday night or anything like that. You know what? That's nice. But there are people who need to hear the hope that is found exclusively in Christ. Amen? So, let me show you one last passage and we'll, we'll wrap it up. 2 Corinthians 5.17 and we're going to go through verse 21. This is just a wonderful passage and it gives us a heart for what we've been called to do. This means that if anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, the old life is gone and a new life has begun. That is our promise in Christ. Amen? I mean, the folks that were on this encounter retreat Friday and Saturday, we have been given a new life in Christ. Amen? This is not, and if you weren't on the encounter retreat, this is the opportunity. I mean, maybe you've experienced it. Maybe you would like to experience it today. There is a new life in Christ. He doesn't just change you. He doesn't just fix you up. He doesn't just take your old and polish it and make it, presentable he kills that old person on the cross with him but he's raised us to new life through his death his burial and his resurrection power okay the holy spirit makes us new creations in christ and our old is not cleaned up it is not behavior modification do better do more christianity it's transformation by the power of the cross amen so we have, been, we have been given a new life. And all of this is a gift from God. We don't deserve this. Amen? If we could, it's shallow. We don't deserve it. It's a gift from God who brought us back to Himself. This is relationship. He's involved in our lives. Brought us back to Himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to Him. Right? Keep going. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself. What did the cross do but bring us from separated by sin to reunited with the Father through the blood of Jesus. Amen? So God, in Christ, was reconciling the world to Himself, no longer counting people's sins against them because they were paid in full by the blood of Jesus. Okay, We can't pay that price. We can't work hard enough. We can't try hard enough. But Jesus paid like we sang this morning, Jesus paid it all. Amen? And He gave us this wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making His appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. Put up that last verse. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Amen? Go back to that, the verse right before. Look at this. The, uh, verse 20. Right before this one. Verse 20. So we are Christ's ambassador. You know what an ambassador is? A representative. Someone who goes on behalf of another. God is making His appeal to the world through us. Crazy. We, 
What a wonderful privilege. What a wonderful opportunity. And what a great responsibility. God is using normal, imperfect people to show His infinite, everlasting, matchless love to the world. What a privilege. What an opportunity. Sometimes, you know, and, I, and I'll just clarify, sometimes the truth is confrontational. I would say oftentimes the truth is confrontational because the truth is the truth. It's like a brick wall. You have to adjust, otherwise you're going to run right into it. Okay, the truth isn't changing. The truth isn't relative. And we need to share the truth of Christ with the world. And that first means receiving the truth of Christ in our own lives. And you know what? Sin has a price. That has to be paid. And it's not just a bad habit. Okay? It's not just something we can write off and excuse. It's... It's a transgression before a holy God. But he gave us his son that all who would repent and believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So the message is that yes, there's bad news. Yes, we are fallen, we've sinned, we've fallen short, and the fruit of that is death and separation from God. But it says, thanks be to God that in the fullness of time he sent his son to die for us. Amen? So sometimes giving someone the truth, it's not going to be received like a lovey-dovey group hug type deal, okay? But you know what? It is still the truth that sets us free. So it's a walk by the Spirit. We need to, we need to reach people with hope that's only found in Christ, okay? And that means being uncompromising in truth, but unwavering in our compassion towards others, okay? The Samaritan was not the guy who fit the bill that the people were expecting to help that broken and beaten man but he was the person who actually showed mercy. And we need to go and do likewise and share the hope that is in Christ alone. Amen? So let's stand and pray. We need to get involved. We need to serve others. And we need to walk in the truth. Share what Jesus has done. So let's pray. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we just glorify your name. God, we thank you that you reached into our darkness. Lord, the mess of our lives... God, and you made us new creations. Father, we thank you that it's only by your blood, it's only by your mercy that we are brought near to the Father and the relationship is restored. God, thank you that we couldn't earn it, we don't deserve it, but you poured your life out unto death that we could be called your sons and daughters and be invited into your family. God, we are so grateful that you chose to get involved. You didn't pass us by but you got involved in our lives, Lord. Father, I pray that you would help us to get involved in the lives of others. Lord, and give us a grace to be transparent. Lord, help us to let other people into our own lives, God. Lord, I pray that you would help us to get involved and you would help us to lay our lives down in service towards others, Father. First towards you, Lord. God, you can't direct what is not in your hands, and I pray that we would first submit ourselves to you, Lord. 
God, that you're the one who has authority over our life. You're the one who makes us new. You're the one who brings us from darkness to light, Lord. And we would first serve and submit ourselves to you, God. And then you would teach us to have eyes for others. God, that we would serve others like you served us, God. Lord, help us to share the hope that's in your name and what you did and accomplished on the cross. Lord, help us to share that there is true transformation in Christ alone. God, that we would be your ambassadors and that you would give us the grace. Lord, help us, equip us to be your ambassadors and make your appeal to the earth. God, to people who don't know you, to people who are in desperate need of you, the hope that is, in, that is found in Christ. Lord, we love you. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We ask that you would work in our lives. And Father, connect us to other people that would spur us on and equip us and encourage us to do the same. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great week.